And if you look early in his ministry, and we'll get to this, I'm jumping ahead, I know, but early <laughs> in his ministry, he says, I, I'm only here, for, I'm not here for the Canaanite woman. I'm only here for the, you know, I'm not going to throw this to the, to the dogs, this message. It's, 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 I'm not going to give the food for the children to the dogs. This is only for Israel. Mm -hmm. And then there's a certain point in his ministry where there's a shift. Mm -hmm. And what a great place for there to be a shift in Galilee of the nations. Shalom and welcome to Hebrew Gospel Pearls, episode number eight. Today we will be discussing Hebrew Matthew chapter three, verses 13 to 17. Keith, I am so excited <laughs> about today's episode because we're going to get to talk about some things in the Tanakh. I'm very excited. You know, it's funny, Nehemiah. I, I, I was really reflecting because this is kind of a shift. We've, we've done seven. Now we're at eight. There's some things that yeah. have happened in between seven and eight. Uh, there's new people now that are here. Some of these people that are here now have no idea <laughs> what's happening, but they're here because they've heard about it. Nehemiah, can you just do me one favor before you get started? Because yeah. I know you're going to go on a tear. Can you yeah. just do me a favor and explain just one more time why it is that you have been excited about doing the Hebrew Gospel Pearls uh, with me? What is, what is it that's really driving you right now? Well, I mean, this is something that we, you know, that I came across and then we had interacted on. Mm -hmm. And it's something I've really been working on for in a way for nearly 18, going on more than that, years. Yes. Um, and, and, and finally to get into the depth of it and to go through it in a systematic way. I've gone through sections, mm -hmm. some of those sections uh, systematically, some with you, mm -hmm. some by myself. Mm -hmm. We've gone through specific subjects. I remember <laughs> there was one incident. We were in a hotel somewhere, and you wanted to know how many times Yeshua appeared, <laughs> the name Yeshua <laughs> in, the New Testament, in the Hebrew version of Matthew, because yeah. we had noticed when you looked at the different translations and you looked at Jesus, yeah. there were, it depends which translation you had, and of course we're doing this by computer, and you would see the NIV has this number, yes. and the NRSV has this other number, and the NASB is the third number. So we yes. said, let's. You said, let's look how many times Yeshua appears uh, in the uh, uh, in in the Hebrew version. So we went through, and I'm reading off. I'm doing a search on my computer, and every time I find <laughs> it, I say Yeshua, 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 and you're like doing a little thing. <laughs> <marking. getting> <laughs> Yeshua, Yeshua. The other reason I'm so, actually bringing this up is some people don't know. We did read this. We wrote yeah. this book together, A Prayer to Our Father, Hebrew Origins of the Lord's yeah. Prayer, which really started us on a journey. And then the journey sort of stopped for me, but it didn't stop for you. It stopped yeah. for me because I, we'd written the book yeah. and we toured and done those things, but you were still studying. You were still gathering manuscripts. And I have to tell you something hit me this morning. I thought about just what you've done over the last year. Can you imagine, Nehemia, all of the places you've been in the last year and now with this worldwide pandemic, you couldn't go to those places this year. So like the timing oh, yeah. of this is literally oh, it, it's kind unbelievable. of like perfect. If, if I tried to do now what I wanted, what I did do last year, it would have been impossible. Mm. So what it, the, the, it's been, a, I mean, I understand a lot of people have suffered and, and I pray for Yehovah to bring healing for all. Yes. But definitely the timing here has been, um, uh, it could have, it could have been that I, <laughs> I set out and I get trapped in like, you know, Russia or Germany or something with the <laughs> pandemic. And instead, I was able to travel all those places and bring back some information. But, but um, I want to tell you something. Um, the reason that I'm asking you, brought up that, that particular issue, is that I've been thinking about what's happened in the last few years. And, and we've always discussed this, but we, like you said, we haven't been able to go through it systematically. So one of the things that I did four years ago, and this is actually going to be a bonus for us as we go forward for the next, who know how many episodes that we have. Um, we started something called the Red Letter Series, which was a, a, an opportunity to just look at the words of Yeshua. Now, here's the funny thing. It actually didn't start until this episode, because this is the first time that Yeshua oh. shows up and he's going to speak. And so I just took the, the process of saying, what are the words that he spoke? We call it the Red Letter Series. It's available at BFA International, free for all. Mm -hmm. But what I was been waiting for, Nehemiah, and I have to tell you this, and to the yeah. people that are listening, what we did was kind of like a introductory level Bible study. And then in the second phase, we, we got a chance to use this amazing tool that you gave us a, um, access to, which is gives, gives us the chance to do an interlinear. But I will tell everyone, I, I'm gonna, I wanna tell everyone this. I'm what? laughing because I just realized you put on a light blue shirt because I'm wearing a light blue shirt. You were wearing a black shirt. I can't believe you changed your shirt. <laughs> when did you do that? <laughs> What do you mean? I follow you for everything, Nehemiah. Are you kidding me? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm sorry I interrupted. Hey, no, so, listen. Wait, it's okay. So folks. you've got the red letter series at PFA. No, it's not. <laughs> hey, 
folks. Listen, Guy, it's been seven Edgar episodes. We're in number eight. It's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, he put up my everything shirt. Everything yeah. he does, I copy it. No, it's golden. No. And so anyway, we did the Red Letter series, free for all. But the thing that you kept saying was we didn't have the ability to really do this because there was some more information that you needed. And so now the timing has worked perfectly. We got you stuck. You can't be on trains, planes, and automobiles flying around the world. And so it's during this time that we're taking advantage of this. And I just want to say to you again, yeah, thank you for your willingness. Uh, <laughs> folks, this is, this is really a deeper process. So I'm looking forward to getting to this. This is when Yeshua shows up as an adult. <laughs> Well, oh, and before we get to that, you know, um, somebody actually challenged me and they said, why are you do a Jewish person? They said, why are you doing this? Why are you teaching about Hebrew Matthew? Uh, it, it, and, you know, from the from perspective of a, a Jew who believes in the Jewish faith, they might say, wait, are you trying to um, strengthen the faith of somebody of another faith? And why would you do that? And my position has been all along, um, certainly for years has been, my goal is to empower people with information. If you say you believe in something, you should know what it is. Yes. You should know what it is you believe. And look, that that brings up here, I think, what for me is maybe the key issue of this episode, Keith, mm. which is that up until now, we've had the infancy a narrative, we had the story of about Yeshua as a child, and I want to read from the Nicene Creed. Excellent. Um, someone actually read this to me. We were talking about what I believe, and he was a Christian, he was talking about what he believed, and he opened up his Bible. And at the front of his Bible, inside the cover page, he had glued onto the cover page the Nicene Creed. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but there's a section there about the Father and about Jesus and about the Holy Spirit. And the part of, that interests me, and we've talked about this before, it says, for us and for ourselves, it's a we believe, right? For us and our, for our salvation, he came down from heaven, that is, Jesus came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made human. He was crucified us for us under Pontius Pilate. And it's profound. Somebody pointed this out to me years ago that what the Nicene Creed doesn't include is everything from Matthew chapters 2 through 26, Mark chapters 1 through 14, Luke chapters 2 through 22, and John chapters 2 through 17, mm. meaning everything. So it says the virgin birth and made human. He was born. Everything from when he was born until he was crucified mm. is not part of the creed mm. of, of Christians for the last 1,700 years, mm -hmm. certainly of mainstream Christian denominations for the last 1,700 years. And I'm excited that we're going to get to talk about the part that's missing from the Christian creed, because they say they believe that Jesus is their Messiah, uh, and they do little sermons about it, and they do study about it. I'm not saying they don't, mm -hmm. but core beliefs don't include everything from Matthew chapters 2 through 26. It's almost like that's a footnote, Yeah, right? He did all of those things, not for the purpose of doing those things, but so he could get to Matthew chapter 27, You know, right? It's almost like Matthew chapters 2 through 26 are this nuisance. Yeah. And if we could just get through them really quick, get to the core, which is Matthew chapter 27 to 28, the crucifixion, yet... Uh, the bulk of the Gospels, I just read you the chapters, mm. are about the things that he did on earth, mm. and uh, I think those are worthy of study. Um, I think they're worthy of study on the level of this is an important document, maybe the, one of the most important documents of Western civilization. Mm -hmm. um, that's number one. Number two, I think if you say you, and that's for Jews who don't believe in Jesus, who aren't mm. Christians, but for Christians who say they believe in him, they should know what it is he did on earth and what he taught. Amen. And many do, but I've met people who literally, all they knew, I mean, I shared years ago about a woman I met on a plane to Tacoma, and she said that her, her knowledge of Jesus came from the movie, The Passion of the Christ. Yes. And she literally had no idea of the stories of the gospel. She knew, of course, the Christmas story. Mm -hmm. So so it actually parallels quite nicely. She knew the Christmas story and she knew the Passion of the Christ, the movie, mm. and everything in between, she had virtually no idea. Of, oh, yeah, I heard something about, you know, stoning a woman, right? And I think those are important to talk about. I think it's important to understand this information. Mm. Um, uh, let me say this, Both, Nathania, like I said, as, the, as a core the, document of Western civilization and yeah. as the basis of people who say they believe in it, they should know what it says. Yeah. And what I'm excited about is I get to come with my Hebrew background mm. and share um, about Jesus as a Jew, about Yeshua, 
as a Hebrew mm. and what that meant in its historical context. You know, we, we, we've done a lot of st studying together. We've done a lot of traveling together and we've come across a lot of different people. And it really is an interesting thing that you just brought up because people tend to want to talk about the, the idea of Jesus, Yeshua, the theology, the things we're supposed to believe. And one of the things that we've always said and what I've always appreciated about you bringing the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew to my attention is that we get to actually look in the language history context of what he said. And, and, it, and there are times when what he says goes well beyond the idea of who we've been taught uh, that he is. So that's what I love about this. Yeah. I'm excited about this yeah. particular episode because I've been waiting for it for 18 years. <laughs> well, actually, it's only been four years since we started mm. the Red Letter series, but we started with this verse. So getting your insights, Nehemia, getting your yeah. thoughts, getting what you've done in terms of study is just going to take the study to a whole different level and people are going to study with us. So yeah. let's get into it. You know, now that I'm talking about it, I'm realizing there's actually a really interesting parallel mm. between the way that Christians approach the Gospels, specifically mm -hmm. the Gospels, and the way that the rabbis approach the Torah. Mm. There's a famous statement in, in um, uh, Rashi, and other rabbis have talked about it as well, which is, why did the Torah begin with Genesis 1-1? Yes. The Torah, it be, Torah means instruction, mm -hmm. and so it should have begun in Exodus 12, verse 2, this new moon is for you, the beginning of new moons. Mm -hmm. And the idea of the question is, if the Torah is a book of instructions, Genesis 1-1 through Exodus 12-1 are completely irrelevant because they're not instruction. So what are they doing in there? They shouldn't even be there. And then they come up with some answer of why they're there, mm -hmm. uh, some legalistic answer, actually. And the point is that the Torah meaning instruction isn't just a book of laws, isn't just a book of rules. The stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those are important in and of themselves. Mm -hmm. and, I, and so I see this interesting parallel. The rabbis want to jump ahead to Exodus 12 too, and the Christians want to jump from Matthew 1 to Matthew, uh, what is it, 27, the uh, crucifixion. Um, and actually there's something in between, and there's a reason that's there. There's a reason that Genesis exists and that the first 12 or 11 chapters of Exodus exist. Yes. They have important messages to tell us. We don't always know what those important messages are. Yeah. Sometimes they only become clear when we meet someone who has no background in this because we take it for granted. Mm. We're like, yeah, we know all this story. Yeah, you know it because you read it. <laughs> There's people who don't know it because they never read it. They never heard it. Yeah. Um, and look, so we're dealing here with, with um, the story of what happened and people are gonna get upset. They're saying, Nehemiah and Keith, Get out of verse, the first verse. I don't even know that we can get to the first verse this time. No, listen, Be folks. Because the background is so exciting and, and important. <laughs> so we've just jumped over from Matthew chapter 2 to Matthew chapter th uh, 3. Mm -hmm. We jumped over really, or really, um, you could say from uh, verses 12 of chapter uh, 3 to verse 13, uh, we jumped over what's called the missing years. Yes. The missing years is what happened to Yeshua between the time he was a child and where he shows up for his ministry about the age of 30. And, and such a thing, and we have, some, we have some documents about these things. Do we know about these? <laughs> well, I mean, there's people who have, who have claimed that he was in India teaching <laughs> yeah. and he was some kind of guru teaching in India. Yeah. Um, to me, what's more interesting is something called the Infancy Gospel of Thomas, mm -hmm. which tells how about Yeshua had these supernatural powers mm -hmm. as a child and he would kill children and resurrect children, and he would you know, strike people with blindness. And one of the more famous things he did, according to the Infancy Gospel of Thomas, is he was given a, uh, there was a clay bird, which was a toy, mm -hmm. and he brought it to life. Mm -hmm. And this is reported in the Infancy Gospel of Thomas, which is undoubtedly a Christian work, right? In other words, it's not part of the New Testament, but Christians were really asking the same question that many people ask, what happened between uh, Matthew 2 and Matthew 3? All right, so Luke gives a story in Luke 2 about how he's 12 years old in the temple. Yeah. So we have one incident from the entire time that he's, um, that, you know, during these missing years. Mm -hmm. What happened during the rest of the time? Yeah. And so whoever wrote the infancy, infancy Gospel of Thomas, either they had traditions about what happened, I find that very unlikely, or they were speculating, and, and or they had traditions that had speculated, right? Mm -hmm. um, the same story about the clay birds appears in the Quran and appears in Toldot Yeshu, which is the Jewish retelling of the Gospels. Some people call it a Gospel parody. Mm -hmm. um, 
most historians don't consider it to have any historical value. But what you can see here is that there's a tradition about Yeshua taking birds and blowing uh, life into them and then flying off. And it appears in these three very different sources, a Christian source, a Jewish source, and a Muslim source. You could say it's just a fairy tale that was made up, right? Mm -hmm. But they all know the same story. That's really mm -hmm. interesting to me. Mm -hmm. um, but now, finally, we don't have to speculate. The missing years are over. <laughs> He's arrived on the scene. <laughs> Can you read? I'll read it in Hebrew, and then I'm going to ask you to, well, no, to read it in English. I want to say something. I, I, and listen, yeah. Nehemiah, and, and folks that are listening, listen, I want to tell you something. Um, and I, wanna, I, wanna, I really want to slow down just for one second. Uh, what we're about to do um, is not being done anywhere in the world. What we're about to do is not being mm -hmm. done anywhere in the world, because what we have access to is, is information with the work that you've done, Nehemiah. And... And again, if you, there's a lot of new people right now in the and I know some people are saying, oh, we've heard that already. But listen, I want to say this again. I want to say this even to the people that are working on this process. What's happening right now, and I get excited about this, Nehemiah, because this is a culmination of a lot of time and effort, a lot of work, um, and especially on your part, in terms of something you said, I think it was in episode, episode five, you were looking at one word in episode five, and I think, and I, I was listening to this. And I think you said you decided to look in all 28 manuscripts. And in order to do that, it took about 15 minutes for each manuscript that you looked in. And I think you said something like it was six hours just for one little piece. Mm -hmm. So when people say, hurry up, you guys, get through this so we can get to uh, 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 Matthew chapter 27. No, no, no. We're going to slow down and let this thing. We're going to enjoy this because this really is mm -hmm. a culmination of a lot of work. So now. Go ahead, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> As by Yeshua me Galil. Then Yeshua came from the Galilee. Mm -hmm. Can we stop there? Uh -oh, we're not going any further. <laughs> Folks, I asked Nehemiah now, a question. I got to say, though, I, I just want to jump in here. And I said, Nehemiah, remember what you told me about the Galilee? He's like, uh, you know, what, which part? And, he, and again, <laughs> language, history, context, the Galilee. Yeah. Can we talk about it? So before we get to the Galilee, I'm real excited about uh, what we're going to talk about in the plus episode, because in the plus episode, we're going to finally get to um, what to me is really exciting is verses 16 to 17. Mm -hmm. And verses 16 to 17, it's going to bring us um, from, from Matthew back to uh, Isaiah and to the Psalms, Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, and Isaiah 42. I'm really excited <laughs> about talking about Isaiah and <laughs> Psalms, but... Okay, we've got to talk about the, the context here. It's not just the context of verses 13 to 17. Mm. This is really, in a sense, the context of Yeshua's entire ministry. Yes. Um, why is it? Let, let, and, and here, I'm going to get in trouble with my Jewish brothers and sisters who are going to say, Nehemiah, uh, we don't even know if Jesus existed, even though he's mentioned in the Talmud. Um, so, so I'm going to get in trouble with some of those people. But just as a thought experiment, God sends his sons to earth. Why not send him to China? Send him to the Yellow River Valley, where one in five people alive today, uh, that's the, the, the basket of their civilization. Mm -hmm. Why not send him to, um, to Rome, the center of the empire at that time? Why not send him to Ctesiphon, the center of the, of the Persian empire at that time? Why send him to a little village in the Galilee? Um, the Galilee was looked down upon by the Jews. We, we have the story about how they say nothing good comes out of Nazareth. Mm -hmm. How could anything good come out? He's from Nazareth? It's like saying, and just to put it in modern terms, imagine if um, the Messiah, someone were to claim today that they were the Messiah, and you say, where is he from? He's from Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> no offense to Cleveland. It's just not what we're expecting, right? And that's the, the analogy here. He's from here New to, York to, City. He's supposed to be from New York City or Los Angeles. Yeah, he's supposed to be from New York or L.A., <laughs> um, one of the, you know, the great cities of the world. He's supposed to be from, you know, Shanghai or Tokyo or Rome. From Nazareth? Exactly. It's, it's not even like saying he's from, from Cleveland. Mm -hmm. It's like saying he's from Toledo mm -hmm. or I'm from Chicago. Imagine if someone were to appear in downtown Chicago and proclaim mm -hmm. themselves that they are, should be the president of the United States. And where are they from? They're from Peoria <laughs> or Aurora, right? Like the middle of nowhere, right? There's just a, a big cornfield. Right. 
And that's what it is really here. Um, and no offense to the people from Aurora, but you, you know I'm right. Yeah. Um, so Galilee it, itself is, is um, and I've actually heard this from uh, tour guides in Israel who will say that there's a fifth gospel. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the fifth gospel they say is the Galilee. <laughs> and what they mean by that is you go through the Galilee and you get all this, this insight. Mm -hmm. And just from the geography, it's really an incredible experience. Right. I've done it. Keith, can I share a quick story that's kind of a side point here? Absolutely. Uh, when I was 10 years old, I made my first trip to Israel. Mm. And my father took us all on a, a tour. And it was a guided tour with a tour guide. And the tour was uh, put out by Eged, which is Israel's national bus company. Mm -hmm. It was an Eged tour, official tour of, this, uh, of, the, of a government entity of Israel. And the tour guide is talking about, and here is where Jesus did this. And here is where Jesus did that. And here's where Jesus is said to have done this other thing. And my father went to the tour guide. He said, we're Jews. We're not interested in anything to do with what Jesus had to say or do. And he was very upset. He's like, why is the government of Israel talking about um, where all these different places are in the life of Jesus? Whether those are correct or not, he didn't even ask that question. He wasn't even thinking in those terms. He was thinking of in terms of, we want to know where King David was and where uh, Saul was. And, and, I, and I agree with my father. We want to know those things too. Mm -hmm. But I think this is also, a it, it's part of the geography of Israel. Mm -hmm. um, you go to places like Cana of Galilee and Ka Capernaum, Kfar Nahum, and it, part of the history is what happened there, right? The Horns of Hattin, which we went to together. Mm -hmm. There's so much history there. I want to hear about how the Crusaders were defeated there uh, in, in, you know, in 12th century. I want to hear about how that's the place where Yeshua uh, preached the Sermon on the Mount. That's part of the and this rabbi lived there later, and here's the tomb of Maimonides. I think all of those things are important. So Galilee, a, as, a, as a character, uh, essentially it's a, we have a character in the New Testament which is called Galilee, mm -hmm. and there's so much charged in Galilee, so much cultural charge, right? Yes. You say Galilee today, people are like, oh, okay, Galilee, where's that? Um, oh, yeah, people look down on it. It's like, you know, Chillicothe, Ohio, right? The middle of nowhere. That, that, that's the people association people had. Um, look up that place, Chillicothe. Uh, <laughs> it really is just a big cornfield. Um, can, can you do me a I favor? There. <laughs> can, can you do me a favor? And this is, yeah. this is more because what happened when I was reading this and I stopped at Galilee, I asked myself a question that I haven't asked any other time that I read Matthew, but because yeah. we're doing this together, I did ask it. I said to myself, I wonder if, if Nehemiah and I were to ask, ask, answer three questions. The language of Galilee, the history and the context of Galilee, would that help us before we get to the place of... Absolutely. So Look, the $64,000 question that a lot of people have asked is, what language did Jesus speak? Yes. And in a sense, that's kind of a, the wrong question. Um, in other words, uh, it, you know, you and I went to um, uh, South Africa, mm -hmm. and we met people who spoke three or four languages. <laughs> and there's and 11 official. <laughs> what's that? There are 11 official... <laughs> That's right, 11 official languages. Yeah. Our uh, perspective, uh, our Eurocentric perspe perspective is that who learns multiple languages? The common man is off working in factories and in fields. He doesn't have time to learn languages. The people who learn multiple languages are people who have leisure time. Mm -hmm. They sit down with their tutor and the tutor recites to them the Latin and recites to them the Greek and they learn multiple languages and then they travel through France and the languages they learn, the language of French they learn, they get to practice it. So our assumption coming from a European cultural background is, and, and by us, I mean the United States, right? Yes. Uh, West people in Western civilization. Our assumption is that people who have leisure time are the people who learn multiple languages. When you go to the third world, you find out that's not true. E that's even not some true. countries that aren't the third world. In China, I would meet people who spoke their local language, who spoke fluent Mandarin, and usually spoke another language that was used in commerce in the area mm. um, from the neighboring village. Uh, and all of those would be defined by linguists as mutually unintelligible languages, sometimes dialects, right? But really mutually unintelligible languages. Um, the local language where I lived in China was more different than Mandarin than Hebrew and Aramaic are. Hebrew and Aramaic <laughs> are sister languages. Yeah. Um, there are hundreds, maybe thousands of words that, uh, uh, that are in common mm. between the two languages uh, and actually between all Semitic languages. 
or many Semitic languages. So for example, the word for uh, child in Hebrew is yeled. In Aramaic, it's yelad. Mm -hmm. And in Aramaic, it's walad. Right? It's the same word, same three consonants, except for the first consonant in Arabic becomes a wa, and in Hebrew, it's a ya. We have the same phenomenon, by the way, happening in Hebrew mm -hmm. with the name chaya, which is, or the word chaya, which means life, and the woman's name derived from that is chava, mm -hmm. right, which is the vav, right? So vav, yud interchanges. We have that in the name Yehovah, by the way, haya, hove, hiya, uh, in the three forms of the verb. Mm -hmm. So the point is, you look across Semitic languages and you see hundreds of words, thousands of words in common, and even the what's called the morphology of the of the of the grammar is very very similar. Mm -hmm. So first of all, in the Galilee, people spoke no question about it. They spoke Hebrew, they spoke Greek, and they spoke Aramaic. Mm -hmm. All three languages were spoken in the Galilee. If you went to Scytopolis, which was the ancient city of Beit She'an, which had been populated and uh, settled by Greeks, and it became a Greek city or Greek-speaking people, at least. Mm -hmm. It was settled by Greeks, Greek-speaking people. They spoke Greek in Beit Sha'an. Mm -hmm. uh, if you had Jews out in the, in the villages around Beit Sha'an, they probably spoke Hebrew, and then you had other people who spoke Aramaic. Mm -hmm. So to ask the question, which language did Yeshua speak, is like saying somebody in the, in the um, village, mm -hmm. in, or the, they call them the townships in South Africa, which of the languages do they speak? Now you can ask, okay, what's their mother tongue? Mm -hmm. meaning what language does their mother speak? But their father might speak a different language. Exactly. Right? And we encounter people like that. Yeah. Um, there's this famous statement of Rabbi Judah the Prince, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. Mm -hmm. Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi is, is a really interesting figure, and we're going to get back to him. So he lived and died in the Galilee, spent his whole life in the Galilee. He's known in Jewish history because around the year, sometime between the year 189 and 210, he compiled... Uh, uh, a great compilation of Jewish teachings, of rabbinical teachings, which became known as the Mishnah. Mm -hmm. Some people call him the author of the Mishnah, but he didn't write the Mishnah. He collected these different teachings and sayings, which became the Mishnah. And then what the Talmud does is it says, well, what about this other statement that Rabbi Judah the Prince didn't include in the Mishnah? It says something different attributed to a similar rabbi or a different rabbi, mm -hmm. right? So the Talmud is actually hashing out the parts, the teachings that Ju Rabbi Judah the Prince didn't include in the Mishnah, this is in the Babylonian Talmud, Baba Kama 82b. Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, Rabbi Judah the Prince says, in the land of Israel, why speak Aramaic? Speak either Hebrew or Greek. And he takes it as a given that you can speak all three languages, right? In his household, he says, we want to speak Greek. We don't want to speak Aramaic. Why not Aramaic? Aramaic was understood to be the language of the heathens. There were Jews who spoke Aramaic, the Targum, which is the ancient Aramaic translation of, of the Torah and then later of the prophets and writings uh, is Aramaic. Mm -hmm. um, but there are also people who spoke Greek. Uh, they also had the ability to speak Hebrew. Uh, the passage in Baba Kama goes on and they say, well, what if you live in Babylonia? What language should you speak? Should you speak Aramaic? Because Aramaic is the native language of Babylonia. They speak no. They say, no, don't speak Aramaic. Speak either Persian or Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Why Persian? Because they were living under Persian rule, and it was the language of the Persian Empire. If you can't speak Hebrew, then speak Persian, but don't speak the language of the heathens Aramaic. Aramaic was really looked down upon. There were still people who spoke Aramaic, no question about it. Really, we have to think of it in terms of all three languages were spoken. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, which, which language did Yeshua speak is the wrong question. He spoke all three languages. He would have spoken different languages and different, different opportunities. Can you, can, you, can you help us with something, Nehemiah? So one of the things that happened, I remember this, I was in uh, Namibia and I was all excited because every time I go to a place, I like to learn a little bit of the language that's there, et cetera. But I was on my way from Namibia uh, uh, to Johannesburg on a, on a South African Airlines. And I remember this so clearly. So I had learned a little bit of um, uh, Afrikaans in Namibia. Mm. When I get on the airplane on my way to Johannesburg, I decided to greet the South African flight attendant in Afrikaans. Mm. And the response was a, a bit negative. Now, I wasn't taking uh. into context why it would be different for the person that's in Johannesburg to feel differently mm. about me coming to speak to them in, in the language of, uh, of Afrikaans. Now, the reason I'm bringing that as an example, I want to ask a question back to the that's time. That's a great example. Hmm? That is a great example because yeah. there's often a ideological um, connotation or attachment 
two specific languages. Like famously in South Africa, there were uh, riots and protests because yeah. they wanted to teach the um, the the black African population Afrikaans in their yeah. schools and not English. And they said, no, we won't be able to communicate with the people of the world. English is the international language yeah. and one of the languages of South Africa. Why should we learn Afrikaans? And, and by the way, the people that were at that point teaching that, them to them, also they looked at from a perspective of oppression, the list goes oh, on and on. Oh, absolutely. So it, here's it, my question. In other question. words, it, it was used specifically to um, to cut them off from the people of the world. That right. was, so and here, it had an ideological connotation to it. So sure. here's my question, and this is an important one, and this is what happened for me. And I, I thought, man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Nehemia this because uh, mm -hmm. you'll be able to answer it. So in the Galilee, mm -hmm. what does Aramaic mean historically? Ah. What does Greek mean historically? And of course, what does Hebrew mean? Now, you don't have to answer all three of those, but at least with Aramaic, can we just take a minute to ask what would it have meant historically? Like, what would be the meaning in, in terms of its background? So Aram is mm -hmm. the name of a people, one of the mm -hmm. peoples who are mentioned in the, in the people's list in Genesis 10. Uh, Aram was a descendant um, of Ever, meaning from what we get the word Hebrew, um, but he spoke a, a, a different language. There were three major Aramean kingdoms, in let's say in the time of 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 the first temple period and before there were three major aramean kingdoms there were um aram damasek that is the aramean kingdom of damascus aram tsova which is today aleppo mm -hmm. that is aram of the city of tsova of aleppo and then there was aram naharayim aram between the two rivers which mm -hmm. we call today iraq or mesopotamia um and so uh, the language we know that that um that well we say that Abraham came from Aram the Harayim, so there's a question, I say we know. There's a question, did he speak Aramaic or did he speak Hebrew? There's no question what Laban spoke. Laban spoke Aramaic. Mm -hmm. And how do we know Laban spoke Aramaic? Because when he makes a covenant with uh, with Jacob, he they make a pile of stones, and we're told that Jacob calls it Gal Ed, mm -hmm. which means a pile as, as a witness, and Laban calls it Yagar Sahaduta. Yagar Sahaduta means a pile of testimony, right? It's yes. not actually even the same name. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and it tells us that in Genesis, that Laban had a different name for it because Laban spoke a different language. Mm -hmm. So by the time of Jacob, we can say with complete confidence, people were speaking Hebrew, whether Ar Abraham spoke Aramaic or Hebrew or both. Uh, I guess we don't really know that. But definitely by the time of, of Jacob, Hebrew was the language. And then Hebrew, of course, was the language that was spoken with different dialects. And we'll get to that in a second with different dialects all the way up until around the ninth century. Mm -hmm. we, we quote in our book, A Prayer to Our Father, I believe we quote, uh, from a rabbi named Rabbi Elijah ben Judah the Nazarite, who wrote what's considered the first grammar of Hebrew. And there he says he sits in the, in the public squares and the streets of, uh, or the markets of, um, of Tiberias to listen to the speech of the common folk yes. so he can fill in some of the blanks in his grammar. Mm -hmm. or his grammar was based on the Hebrew of the Bible, but you know, not everything we, that existed in ancient Hebrew is in the Bible. I Meaning, imagine if we didn't know a word of English and all we had of English was the writings of Shakespeare. So there's a lot more to English than what's in Shakespeare. And so he had to hear from the common folk and hear them speak to know what some of the rules were as late as the ninth century, which is pretty incredible, or maybe even the beginning of the 10th century. So I want to get to Galilee. Galilee is a character in the New Testament, and that's why it's important to talk about. And Galilee, boy, we're running out of time. <laughs> so we're, we're not running get out to of the time. first verse. Keep plugging. But, but no, but we will get to the we will get to the part about uh, ver, you know the last two verses in, in the plus episode. That that is my goal. Um, okay, so um, but I think this is important. Like I said, it's not just a background of these verses; it's a background of of all four gospels in a way. Um, so Galilee is referred to in the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 1, which this is, is what English I was is, waiting to get to, <laughs> which in the English is chapter 8, verse 23, yes. as Galil HaGoyim, mm -hmm. Galilee of the Gentiles or Galilee of the nations. Yes. Now, I want to stop here for a second. I've had people talk to me and they think the word Goyim is an insult that Jews use to refer to Gentiles. Mm -hmm. Maybe there are some Jews who use it that way. I haven't encountered that. Mm -hmm. I grew up. In a, in a community of Jews who, how do I say it, were not politically correct when it came to non-Jews. Mm -hmm. And they had a, a, um, a slur for non-Jews, and it wasn't goyim. Mm -hmm. I won't even say what it was, because it's quite offensive. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't goyim. It's something that means abomination. Mm -hmm. So if a Jew wants to refer to non-Jews, 
in a negative way, he doesn't say goyim. Goyim mm -hmm. just means the people of the nations. Mm -hmm. and, and Israel's called a goy. Israel's called a nation. But here, Galilee of the nations, mm -hmm. in uh, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 23, in the English 9, 1, in the Hebrew, um, raises the question, why is it called Galilee of the nations? And the real answer is we don't know 100% why, but it probably do dates back to 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 11, where Solomon is building the temple and he needs large cedar trees for the roof and some of the supporting beams. Mm. And he gets them from King Hiram, King, ha King Hiram of Tyre, of mm. Tzor. Uh, in Hebrew, the city's called Tzor. Tyre to this day is a city on the coast of Lebanon. At the time, it was a Phoenician city. Phoenician is what the Greeks called the Canaanites. So it's a Canaanite city. Mm -hmm. And Solomon, as a payment for all of this wood that he's given, gives 20 cities in the Galilee to Hiram of Tyre. <laughs> Yeah. And, and so he's... why do we have Galilee of the Gentiles, yeah. Galilee of the nations? Yeah. Probably because Solomon gave it over to um, the, to to Hiram. Do you remember what Hiram uh, said? Tell me what he said. About the quality of those cities? What does he say? <laughs> These are the cities you give me? <laughs> words, You're saying he wasn't very grateful. That, well, no, he was saying the, the, these are not. You know, in other words, I, I guess when I, heard, when I hear in, the, in Isaiah and then also going forward, um, just geography. Syria, yes. Lebanon, Israel, present day, what was happening there and who was there? I mean, it just seems like when you ask the question about why would he send him there, beyond the fact that it's Israel, um, um, but th this, this thought from Isaiah that says, when I read Isaiah that said, Galilee of the Gentiles, and then when I thought about Yeshua being in the Galilee, th yeah. I've heard a lot of people go on and on about that, but it is kind of yeah. cool that, uh, that that is where he came from, especially in terms of the mission of not just reaching uh, those that were with him, but reaching yeah. people beyond. Here's, all right, so now that you drew us into this, here's something really interesting. So let's read it. Um, verse 11 of 1 Kings chapter nine, King Hiram of Tyre, having supplied Solomon with cedar and cypress, timber and gold, as much as he desired, King Solomon gave to Hiram 20 cities in the land of Galil of <laughs> Galilee. But when, he, when Hiram came from Tyre to see the cities that Solomon had given him, it says, Lo yashru they were not straight in his eyes. He didn't like them. <laughs> Therefore, he said, what kind of cities are these that you have given me, Achi, my brother? <laughs> I love he calls him Achi. <laughs> so they are called the land of Kabul, Kavul in Hebrew to this day. What does Kavul mean in biblical Hebrew? Maybe it means bound. It's not clear, and probably it's not a Hebrew word. Mm -hmm. Kavul is probably a... a, a a Canaanite word mm -hmm. in the Canaanite language. And so here we have a word play. We, we talk, all, talk all the time about word plays, which scholars call paranomosia. Mm -hmm. um, it's a play on words, word puns, mm -hmm. that the name Jacob has to do with the word in Hebrew. Here there's a word play with the word kavul, which may have been understood at the time of, of Solomon. But here we hear that today and we're like, does it mean bound? Does it mean like Baal maybe? It's not clear what it means at all. Mm -hmm. um, Apparently, it's something disparaging, right? Because he doesn't like it. Mm -hmm. So that was Galilee of the nation. So think about this. From the time of Hiram, these cities are looked down upon, these cities of the Galilee. Now, this isn't yeah. the entire Galilee. Galilee is a large region, but it mm -hmm. was 20 cities in the Galilee. Now let's fast forward to the time of Zerubbabel, who is the leader who brings the Jews back from Babylonia. Mm -hmm. And we're given the list of the different people and where they settled. And all of those people are settling in what today we would call uh, Judea. Mm -hmm. That is, they're settling in areas that were the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah during the first temple period. So they're, you know, we think of they, or I thought of as a kid, we're coming back from Babylon, and I think, oh, it's it's they're they're settling every nook and uh, cranny of Israel. Not at all. It's a tiny little province in what today is uh, central Israel. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't even include some major parts of Israel that we think of. Doesn't include Samaria. Doesn't include the Jezreel Valley. Mm -hmm. Doesn't include the Northern Jordan Valley. <laughs> I mean, these are the, <laughs> the, the breadbasket of Israel is not included. Doesn't include the Galilee at all. And what happens is um, there are Jews who are living in these areas in Southern Israel and there is uh, the war against the Greeks. The Greeks come and they want to wipe out the Jewish faith. This is the famous story of Hanukkah. We're not going to get into the whole thing. You ask about the connotation of Greek. For a lot of Jews, the connotation of Greek was persecution. Yes. It was it, saying Greek was a, almost the same as saying 
expunge my Jewish identity. There it is. That was the understanding. To this day, by the way, there are many Jews where you talk about Hellenize or you use the word assimilate, and those are dirty words. Yes. Because assimilate means give up my Jewish identity. Um, Hellenize means adopt somebody else's culture instead of my culture and faith. Mm -hmm. uh, so Greek has very negative connotations. Even though Rabbi Judah the Prince, he preferred Greek over Aramaic. As bad as Greek was, Aramaic was considered worse to him. Mm -hmm. um, Jews who are in southern Israel, and they're persecuted by the Greeks, and they want to wipe out the Jewish faith. That becomes the Hanukkah story. There's a war with the Maccabees, or actually they're called the Hasmoneans in, uh, in Jewish sources. The Hasmoneans, the Hashmonaim, they fight against the Greeks, and they have some kind of limited victory. They win, they lose, they win, they lose. It goes back and forth. Finally, some Jews during this period are able to get a foothold in the Galilee. Yes. So we, we don't hear much about the Galilee uh, until finally we fast forward until um, after Isaiah. And by the way, Isaiah 9-1 might be talking about something referred to in 1 Kings 15-29, which is the exile of the Galilee in the time of Tiglat Pileser III, yes. approximately 732 BC. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 9, in that whole context, is around about the Assyrian invasion. Mm -hmm. That is, King Ahaz is about to be attacked by the king of Israel and the Aramean king of Damascus, and God promises him that the king of Israel will be destroyed. Mm -hmm. And then in chapter 9, he mentions the Galilee of the nations, which might be the exile there mm -hmm. under Tiglat Pileser III. Now jump forward to around the year 161, 160 BC. It's during the time of Judah the Maccabee when he is the lead, leader of the Hasmoneans. Mm -hmm. And we read um, that there is an emissary that comes from the Galilee. And, and uh, first, we're not going to read the whole thing. First Maccabees 5, 14 to 23, we hear about how the Galilee of the nations, and their nations no doubt means Gentiles, absolutely 100%. It's, we're told there the Galilee of the nations want to wipe out the Jews in the Galilee. Mm. And so they send a, a, an army, a military force under Simon, the brother of Judah, Simon the Hasmonean, up to the Galilee, and, it's, and he defeats the, this army that's come to attack the Jews. And then it says in verse 23 of 1 Maccabees 5, then Simon took the Jews of Galilee mm -hmm. and Arbata with their wives and children and all they possessed and led them to Judea with great rejoicing. So how many Jews could have possibly been in Galilee? <laughs> If he's able to empty the Galilee and bring these Jews to safety out of Galilee into Judea, maybe there was a thousand Jews, two thousand Jews. I doubt there were that many. In other words, they understood this was part of the biblical land of Israel and they wanted to settle the land that God gave them. So there were Jewish settlers, literally Jewish settlers in Galilee. And at some point, the local population of Galilee, who are called the Eturians, and we'll talk about that in a minute. They decide we're going to kill all the Jews. Mm -hmm. And so they send a military expedition and they bring the Jews out of Galilee back into, into uh, Judea. Um, you could say there was a similar thing that happened in modern times, which is that there were 10,000 Jews living in Gaza, which is part of the historical land of Israel. Yes. And the state of Israel, right or wrong, and I think they were wrong, but they right or wrong, got said, we want to bring these Jews out so they don't get slaughtered by the Arabs. So we actually have a modern parallel to what happened. So so 1 Maccabees 5.23, Galilee is Judenrein. It is free of Jews. There's not a single Jew in the Galilee because they'd be killed if they were living there. And then fast forward to Josephus Antiquities uh, 13, 318, and it's in the time of Judah Aristobulus. Judah Aristobulus is one of the five sons of John Hyrcanus, and he reigns for a single year, the year that's approximately 104 to 103 BCE. So we know exactly when he ruled, you know, give or take a year, these, these numbers are approximate. It says, Judah Aristobulus conferred many benefits on his own country, this is Josephus writing, and made war against Eturia and added a great part of it to Judea and compelled the inhabitants, if they would continue in that country, to be circumcised and to live according to the Jewish laws. Mm -hmm. So he conquers the Galilee, this area of Eturia. Now, Eturia was a large area, what today covers parts of Syria and Lebanon. He didn't conquer all of that. He only part, conquered the part that today we would call the, the, the Galilee. Mm -hmm. So he's conquered this part of Eturia, and he says to the people there, convert or leave. <laughs> and many of them, and this is actually unprecedented with one exception in Jewish history. The other exception is John Hyrcanus. His father did the same thing to the Idumeans. 
Herod's. That is the people who lived in what today is Southern Judea, right? Who had uh, come and occupied Southern Judea, the area around Hebron. Famously, Herod is the grandson of, of a forcibly converted Idumean. So they were forcibly converted to Judaism. And then Josephus goes on and he quotes Strabo, who's a Greek historian. And, and Strabo, of course, is writing from the Greek perspective what he knows about Judah Aristobulus' conquest of the Galilee. He says, this man was a person of candor and very serviceable to the Jews, for he added a country to them and, attain, and obtained a part of the nation of the Eturians for them and bound them to them by the bond of circumcision of their genitals. Right. Right. To, to, uh, to Strabo, the Greek historian in Asia Minor, this is some bizarre, uh, exotic ceremony that the Jews say, if you want to be part of our nation, you have to be circumcised. Um, right to Josephus, it's just, okay, follow the Torah uh, and be circumcised. So we have here, the Galilee is free of Jews. There's not a single Jew living in the Galilee in 1 Maccabees 5.23, around the year 160 BC. Mm. And then around 60 years later, a little less than 60 years later, it's conquered by Judah Aristobulus, and from then begins the Jewish settlement of the Galilee. Mm -hmm. And this actually ties in perfectly to what we read in Luke, <laughs> right? In Luke, we hear about how there is this, um, there's this census that the Romans are carrying out. And we're told, well, you have to go back to your ancestral homeland. Why is this ancestral homeland Judah, Bethlehem of Judea? Why isn't it Nazareth? Because Nazareth was a Jewish settlement. The Jews came from Judea after the conquest of, um, of Judah Aristobulus, and they settled in uh, northern Israel, including in Nazareth. You could literally say that Yeshua was a Jewish settler, and he was from a family who hadn't been that long in the Galilee, 100 years, right? What is that, maybe three or four generations, mm -hmm. right? Wasn't that long in the Galilee to the point where they remembered, yeah, we came back from uh, Ephrata, from uh, Bethlehem, from that little village near Jerusalem, mm -hmm. and now we're in the Galilee in Nazareth. Um, and so that's how Yeshua ends up in the Galilee. And then we later hear about this in Matthew. And I'm going to say it for when we get to Matthew about the different accents and pronunciations. <laughs> but the people of Galilee were looked down upon. And I just want to read one last thing. We didn't even get to the verse. The, we read half a verse, but it was worth it. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I, the thing that hits me is as I always, I, I always think about like when you said your fa family went to the Galilee, um, being in the Galilee, the, the, the part of it that just kind of shakes me up a little bit is just that the geography of it exists still today. So for example, the Sea of Galilee may have been larger, but it was the Sea of Galilee. The, the hills, the mountains, even can I go so far like the 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 um the actually the, the valley itself and and how he would have gotten from the Galilee where he was going. And it's very possible to be around the same yeah. place like where the road is today. Isn't is that, oh, is the, that the, the roads are more or less in the same place for simple reason that the roads follow natural contours, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and somebody comes along and they try to build a new road. This happened in the, in the near the near uh, En Gedi, mm -hmm. where they built, they thought, oh, the, the road is circuitous. Let's build the straight road. Mm -hmm. Well, a flash flood comes once every 10 years and washes the road away. <laughs> There's a reason the road is where it was. <laughs> so here's- And so here's... the same roads are in the same place for thousands of years because of geographical um, reasons and strategic reasons and all kinds of things like that. Okay, before yeah. we before we go any further, okay, I, before we read this verse, I want to just say one other thing about the verse. But, um, but do you have anything else to say about this language history context of the Galilee? Because I oh, think this so, so is So here, here's one of the most interesting things to me. We said we'd do this thought experiment. God could send his son to anywhere in the world. He doesn't send him to the, to the cradle of Chinese civilization or the cradle of Indian civilization or the cradle of European civilization, he sends him according to the New Testament and, and, and the belief there, he sends him to a little tiny village in the Galilee, which isn't looked down, which is looked down upon. And one of the reasons it's looked down upon is the people there are Jewish settlers. Mm -hmm. They've only been there for a few generations. They don't have long uh, uh, roots in that land. Mm -hmm. The people of Israel do, but the Jews who came from Judea don't. And on top of that, a lot of the people in Galilee are converted Jews. Mm -hmm. And there were definitely Jews who were obsessed with genealogies. Paul mm -hmm. talks about that. And the gene, you know, and, and they would say, well, okay, you know, I, I'm a true Jew. Your your great great grandfather was forcibly converted to Judaism. Are you even are you even really a faithful Jew? Or did you do it out of convenience? And the population who lived there were called the Eturians. Mm -hmm. Um 
Now, some people will describe them as Arabs. Uh, are, one of the earliest reference to them is from the same uh, Greek historian we heard about before, Strabo, mm -hmm. in uh, Book 16, uh, Chapter 2. He refers, to, he says, the Eturians and the Ar Arabians, right? The Arabs are a separate group, all of whom are freebooters. I had to look up the word freebooter. <laughs> freebooter is a pirate on the land. Uh, it comes from the Dutch. All of whom are freebooters occupy the whole of the mountainous tracts. Mm. Now, he's talking actually after the conquest uh, and the conversion of the Eturians. So he's talking about the Eturians who live in Lebanon. Mm. He said the husbandmen, meaning the, um, the, the shepherds, live in the plains, and when harassed by the freebooters, mm -hmm. they require protection of various kinds, mm -hmm. and the robbers have strongholds from which they issue forth. So he describes the Eturians who are not conquered, the ones that uh, Judea Aristobulus couldn't conquer because mm -hmm. maybe they were held up in the mountains. They come down and they harass the people who live in the plains who are raising sheep, and this is their way of life for both the Eturians and the Arabs. Well, the Eturians in Galilee, they became Jews. Mm-hmm. Now, there's a question about, are these Eturians Semites or not Semites? Uh, and I'm now convinced a little bit more than I was in the past that maybe they're descendants of Ishmael, Ishmael, uh, Yishmael, we're told in Genesis 25, 15, and 1 Chronicles 131, had a son named Yatur. Mm -hmm. And Eturians could be Yaturim. We're told in 1 Chronicles 5, 18 through 22, we don't have time to get to it, how there was a war in Transjordan with a, a bunch of different nomadic tribes, and one of those are, are the Yatur. Yatur that is the Iturians. Um, so the Iturians who came into Galilee and Lebanon were ones who earlier had been in Transjordan, and maybe they were all over the place, they were nomadic. So what we have is, um, we have something really interesting, that Yeshua's um, not place of birth, because according to the New Testament, that's Bethlehem, uh, but the place where Yeshua grows up, to be more accurate, is Nazareth. And why Nazareth? It could have been anywhere. Why Galilee? And here's something we've talked about in the past. I'm going to let you run with this. Galilee is a place where there are three types of people. There are Jews who are descended from Jacob and Judah. There are Jews who have joined the, themselves to the people of Israel and the God of Israel. And they didn't have to, you know, I say forcibly converted, but they could have left. 90% mm -hmm. of the Eturian homeland was in what's today Lebanon mm -hmm. and never came under the rule of the Maccabees or the Hasmoneans, mm -hmm. never came under Jewish rule. They could have left. And then there were people who were Gentiles, just, you know, straight out Gentiles who spoke Greek and some spoke Aramaic. So you had three types of people in Galilee. So I wonder if this was not one of the reasons that this was chosen, because we have this Galilee of the nations, Galilee of the Gentiles, and that's the place where he's chosen to grow up. What do you think about that, Keith? You know, the thing, I, Nehemi, I don't, I don't only think about that, but I also, and I know we're going to have there's going to be so much more that we'll always be, come back to. But I even think about the fact that uh, we don't hear about him until this time. Luke says it around age 30. What was he doing there? Who was he interacting where? How was he being prepared uh, to do the very thing he's about to go and do? And you have to, I have to wonder if it wasn't because of all of that diversity, the diversity of people, the diversity of thought, socioeconomic diversity. We didn't even go into all of that. But I mean, you're talking yeah. about a, a place that's, can I use the word, um, I don't know if I, this is a, a good word, a melting pot <laughs> of people from different places, different languages, different thoughts. And, and from there is where he, he was at. And again, we're going to find out later what he was doing before he gets to John. But um, I think well, so, it's, yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to summon the, the Jewish principle I've talked about, I've talked about before, which is ma'ase avot siman lebanim. Mm. That is the actions of the fathers are signs to the sons. Mm. And I have to wonder here if the reason that this was chosen as the place was, in a sense, um, foretelling what would happen mm -hmm. later for those who followed Yeshua, Yeah. right? And if you look early in his ministry, and we'll get to this, I'm jumping ahead, I know, but early <laughs> in his ministry, he says, I, I'm only here, for, I'm not here for the Canaanite woman. I'm only here for the, you know, I'm not going to throw this to the to the dogs, this message. It's, 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 I'm not going to give the food for the children to the dogs. This is only for Israel. Mm -hmm. And then there's a certain point in his ministry where there's a shift. Mm -hmm. And what a great place for there to be a shift in Galilee of the nations. Now, here's the thing. It, we're, we're about, we're going to read the verse. Okay, we, we actually read the verse. Um, if, if you listen to the earlier episodes, you have an understanding of who John is. You have an understanding of what his ministry was. You have an understanding of where he was. And then Yeshua says, okay, now it's time for me to leave the Galilee to go and meet my cousin John to do what? <laughs> to be baptized. <laughs> 
What does that mean, Nehemiah? <laughs> well, I don't know that we're going to have time to get to the whole yeah. thing, but what I, yeah. here's what I want to get to in, in the plus episode. Mm. I want to get to, um, and maybe we'll just mention it really briefly, the statement in, in verse 14 about John having doubts about whether he should even baptize Yeshua. Mm -hmm. And then verses 16 to six, 17, for me, that's the money ball. Yeah. Um, because that's, I mean, that's a very rich passage. There's so much to talk about. You, you could write a book mm -hmm. on verses 16 to 17. Mm -hmm. We're going to do it in an hour or so. Uh, so guys, if you want to get the rest of the discussion, come over to NehemiahsWall.com where we'll have yeah. Hebrew Gospel Pearls Plus number eight. Uh, for those who are members of my support team, it's, a, it's kind of a thank you for those who support my ministry. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we decided to do is because there's two ministries involved here is that on alternating weeks, uh, one week it'll be on Keith's website, the plus episode, uh, other week it'll be on my web website. Uh, I've had people complain. They said, Nehemiah, I support your ministry. You should put all, all of it on your website. Okay, but there's two ministries here who are doing this. You're doing it together with me. And so we had to find an equitable way of doing this, and this is how we chose to do it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's the bonus. Look, we just talked for an hour. <laughs> Most people, let's be honest, aren't going to listen even to the entire hour, unfortunately. Yeah. For those who really want to go in depth, they'll come to the support team study and do the plus episode. You know, and I want to I want to give people this. I just want to say this again. I think the plus, at least up to this point, when we do the plus episodes, it's it's absolutely, it's amazing. It's it's Nehemiah. I just have to say it's it really is amazing. So I really want to encourage people to do that. Is to go over to Nehemiah's wall and enjoy uh, the plus. And I'm telling you right now, it's going to be epic. <laughs> Um, but for those of you that don't want to go any further, you still have opportunities at Nehemiah's Wall. Many, many, many things that are there. Free materials at Nehemiah's Wall. BFA International. Free information there. We have the Red Letter Series, which is free. You're, you can you can get little parts of it, little pieces of what we're doing, but nothing like the plus uh, that we're getting ready to do now. So I hope that people will take advantage of it because it really has been a game changer the, uh, so far. Keith, would you end with a prayer and then I'll absolutely I will. Father, thank you so much for um, the information that you've uh, provided. Thank you for uh, the inspiration and thank you for the parts that are being revealed to us even as we study and look at all of this information, uh, the, the manuscripts, uh, the work that uh, Nehemiah has done, the time that he has spent, the resources that have been spent. We, we don't take this as a small thing. We thank you for this opportunity to continue studying uh, about this, uh, this, this ancient text that we have access to. Thank you so much for your goodness and your grace and the people that have been a part of this so far, we just pray that you'd continue to encourage them in their faith, in your name. Amen. Jehovah, I am so grateful that you've given me the opportunity, little old me, from not a special place in the world, from Chicago, to have the opportunity to empower people with information based on the ancient Hebrew sources of their faith, even if their faith isn't my faith, even if I don't understand the same things they understand or agree with the same things they agree with, but that they truly want to serve you and walk in your path and understand what you've communicated to mankind. I want them to understand that based on its historical history, language, and context. Father, I'm so thankful that I've gotten the chance to walk through the places of history, the places of the Tanakh, places of the New Testament, and places of history that happened after that, of pivotal events in history, all in that small little land, the land of Israel, and Judah, and the Galilee, and, and in, everything in between. Mm. Yehovah, I, I feel special that most of my ancestors read about these places and didn't know where they were, what they were. They had to speculate about them. I've gotten to touch those places and walk through them. I'm so grateful, Yehovah. Thank you for giving me access to all of the documents and manuscripts and resources that I have. It's a great blessing to me, and I hope to bless others who want that information. But I can only do this if it's according to your will and with your help. Yehovah. Amen. Amen. You have been listening to Hebrew Gospel Pearls with Nehemia Gordon and Keith Johnson. For a more in-depth study, check out Hebrew Gospel Pearls Plus at NehemiahsWall.com and BFAInternational.com. Thank you for your support.